I'm really pleased now we have uh, Teek uh, Lenahan uh, to joining us. Uh, Teek is the uh, Executive Director of Innovation Strategy at Frog. And once again, everybody knows Frog, right? <laughs> I, I, I would hope, at least in this room, they should. Frog is a global product uh, and a strategy design firm. Uh, Teek uh, co-leads the, uh, the Frog Labs exploratory uh, innovation platform. Prior to joining Frog, uh, Lenahan was an associate partner at Gravity Tank, one of our local firms here in Chicago. He was at the Profit Brand Strategy and Anderson Consulting, which uh, was Accenture. Uh, Teek has uh, his MBA uh, from our very own university here, uh, with his focus was in uh, marketing and strategy from Kellogg, and he serves as a member of the uh, Triple M Program Innovation Council. So, Teek, welcome. Thanks, Thanks Walter. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for welcoming me. It's uh, really nice to be back. Um, when he said I got my MBA from a, an institution here in Chicago, he didn't mean University of Chicago, just to be clear. As a matter of fact, 15 years ago uh, this month, I was in this room taking the tech venture class. Uh, the dot-com bubble was bursting in March of 2000. We didn't quite know it really yet, um, but we were all gathered here in a packed room to talk about uh, the e this, this new e-commerce thing that was uh, going to be huge. Um, so we were really at the peak of that. So it's really nice to be back in this room. Um, a little piece of anachronistic history. We were told we couldn't have our laptops out with a white cord, our Ethernet cord, because that meant we were surfing the web in class, and that was uh, verboten. So if you can imagine like that, and I remember Wi-Fi coming out, we're like, that name is so stupid, that won't stick. <laughs> um, so it's really nice to be back in this room. Glad to see no white cords. <laughs> I don't even know if they're Ethernet plugs anymore. Um, but anyway, it's really, it's really nice to be here. So um, design is strategy. And I think some of the, and maybe Kathleen's had uh, a little bit of this too, some of the slides translated a little weird when we mushed them all in the same presentation. But um, what I wanted to talk about today is, especially with this crowd in the room, you guys are all very savvy about this topic. Um, and so I was going to challenge myself to think of something that I hadn't talked about before, brand new presentation, uh, brand new stuff about what we're working on uh, to share with you guys. But it's sort of uh, designed as internal strategy is maybe the qualifier uh, for this. And um, I wanted to say that because I think we, we talk a lot about how we can use design to help organizations, our clients, um, our companies, but what we haven't talked about maybe as much is really about ourselves. Um, so these are, we call ourselves frogs, in the Seattle studio where I'm from, um, doing an actual workshop. So kind of funny. So what's the story that I want to tell today? Um, does this thing work, by the way? Yeah, OK. So the story that I want to tell, so I can walk around a little bit, is um, the macro events have changed the zeitgeist. So being here 15 years later, that's going to be a little bit of an echo. And there's a new generational mindset. I don't mean age. I mean just kind of like a, uh, across a bunch of generations. There's really a, a shift in how people are thinking. I think those probably won't be terribly contentious. Um, but I think that companies need to embrace this as a strategic move, this shift. You can either fight some of the things that are going on, or you can embrace it and figure out, what am I going to do about it? Uh, design has a perspective on this shift, as you might imagine, from giving a talk at this conference. So it might have something to say about that. And Frog is embracing this shift with what we're calling accelerators. So this is basically what we're going to talk about um, here, in a, here in a bit. So one of those macro trends, we don't need a refresher. Pets.com is obviously the, the mascot, uh, pun intended, of the, the, the era. JDS Uniphase, um, I had to throw up there because that was one of the stocks. I remember thinking when I was here, I wish I had had the money to buy, but I was in grad school. Uh, because it did that, and then, of course, it did that afterwards. Um, and then in 2008, we had, obviously, the, the financial um, collapse. So it has really altered the way we think. I personally was laid off by a firm in 2002. Um, so there's a very personal side to this as well. So if you want to talk about sort of the ages, Gen Y has been shaken by some of these events. I know my friends were getting their um, second year of Kellogg, getting their offers rescinded uh, that were their ticket out, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and millennials are, are realistic, maybe about expectations, about financial aid, student loans, these sorts of things. 
And as I step back, and I wanted to talk about what we're doing at, at Frog and sort of design his internal strategy, I thought there'd be something that I could call the Kickstarter generation. Um, and by that, I mean that there's kind of a few things that have added up to this. With some of those macro factors, we see that people are a little less risk averse, maybe more realistic, and therefore more entrepreneurial. And I'm talking about people in this room and sort of your cohort across the United States. Um, and you, you combine that with more access to capital and operations resources, and by that I mean things like Kickstarter, um, other things that enable sort of removing the friction of, of startups and commerce. Um, and you wind up with a more creative and independent workforce. I think everybody in this panel represents that. Um, you guys are, are looking at, at those careers or in those careers now. And importantly, that workforce is, is looking for more than just a paycheck. Um, you know, there might have been at some point, and I think, you know, kind of the, think of the 50s or whatever, get on the company track, you get a paycheck, it, maybe your identity isn't really wrapped up much in your job, but it, it, it's a path. And you do your job and you kind of get your money and you retire and get a gold watch. Um, I think everybody here is looking for more meaning in their jobs, in their careers. Um, and so when you look at that, this is kind of a challenging thing for more traditional companies. And I don't just mean big. Um, and I don't mean, again, age. This isn't a generational thing, even though I've used that word. It's really about the corporate culture that persists. Um, and so, you know, if we think about this Kickstarter generation, there's a couple things um, to think about that. What does this mean for companies? So if you look out there, what do you do? Don't fight the change. Learn how to live with it. Um, and we hear things that people are saying both at Frog and I think in general, bless you, um, things like, let me flex the muscles I have and will develop. Um, some hidden latent talent that they have or skills that they've developed. Um, the programs here are really building those. Understand me as a person, not a human resource. Um, I started my career at Anderson Consulting. I have really good things to say about that experience. But we were largely interchangeable at that point. Um, so much so that everybody joked that we were called Androids before there was this Google thing called Android. Um, but that they were really re human resources, and you need some bodies to ship down to Florida for a client, you, you just you find some and you ship them. Um, that's not what people are looking to do now. Um, and I think really interestingly for companies, if you allow these things to kind of live and breathe, um, your employees um, will find new ways to create value. Um, and specifically, this is what I'm saying at Frog, this is what other frogs are saying, I can create new ways of value. I think Kathleen referenced that, um, and I think you'll hear some of the same things when you talk about things like ventures. So design's role in this world is pretty well understood. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I knew my colleagues up here would be touching on these. Kathleen did already. There are ways to go at creating new value, new growth, uh, that are really different than there have been historically. And they're really creating game-changing kinds of things in uh, physical products, in digital products, brands, experiences, services, et cetera, across all the stuff that we work on, healthcare, banking, theme parks, sports equipment, you name it, um, we do it. And so this is a really well kind of understood area. But what about in this context? And I specifically, and I love that Kathleen called this out about the human element, I didn't put any pictures up here of people because we talk a lot about the result. But when you think about the people, this is the Seattle studio, this is our Thanksgiving feast, um, don't tell my mom, but I think my best Thanksgiving dinner is in the Seattle studio of Frog. <laughs> so everybody brings a dish and they put their all into that one dish, so they're all amazing. Um, but anyway, this is, you know, this is what we do. People actually like each other, they smile, and they have a good time. Um, but what is, what is the role of design in, in corporate culture and design as strategy, not to compete with the competition out there, but the strategy about how do we build a company where people want to work and where it's meaningful for them? So how do we do that? Um, specifically, here's that H word again, design is about understanding the human. And you have to do that if you want people to actually work for you and get excited. And as we look at it, I'm not talking about people working for me, I'm talking about me as an employee of Frog. I want to be excited about the, the, um, the place where I'm working too. That role is expanding. Um, and if you think about sort of this notion of how far design has expanded in its, in its definition, um, you can talk about colonizing um, different areas of influence, whether you want to call it different, you know, experience design, social impact, the government, automotives, um, hospitality, and you have programs like the Triple M program, the D School, et cetera, that are all working on um, applying 
design more broadly in our lives? How could we be more human-centered? Isn't that a good thing? I don't think we can sort of argue with that. And a friend of mine who's a, a journalist in the New York Times um, was talking about um, economics. And uh, one of the things he talked about was this notion that economists are planting their flag in, in new areas. You think about free economics and called it intellectual imperialism. And you can call that about design too. It's out there planting its flag in all these new areas. Design can solve healthcare, design can solve uh, poverty in Africa, all these kinds of things. Um, and that may be true, uh, but it is really leading to such a mainstream application of design thinking that it's actually becoming absorbed. And by that I mean, it used to be that design was practiced by those who were few and went to design school and they went to design grad school and they practiced this thing called design. It was their craft and I still hear that word quite a lot. But the need for a human-centric approach to solving big problems has gotten too big for that small cadre of designers to be able to do it and actually scale. So what my perspective is, and I won't speak for Frog, but I think design is gonna become a, a normal part of business. Um, and by that I mean it's gonna be really a moving from the province of the few to being democratized. So there's a bunch of things, you may not recognize all of these acronyms, but so you look throughout the last several decades, total quality management, um, Six Sigma, business process reengineering, a bunch of things were the latest and greatest. And they had practitioners who were the high priests of their discipline and they advocated for it and they were highly desirable and a small bunch of people. Well, now you have quality that's part of a company. It's no longer a small bunch of people who know quality, companies do quality. When I graduated from Kellogg, I had a triple degree. It's funny, in my intro, I forgot that uh, I intentionally leave one out now. So I had uh, marketing, management, and strategy, and I had something called technology and e-commerce. <laughs> it's kind of just now business. Um, but at the time, it was a thing. And at the time, these were all things. And I think design, as it gets bigger and bigger, will actually become sort of one of those things. It's part of, really, this uh, democratization. I don't think that's a bad thing, by the way. I think some designers who are still sticking to their craft and spent their years apprenticing doing this really want to hold that uh, dear. But more and more, they're not doing that and looking at the ability to impact a broad spectrum. Bless you. Um, so if that's true, going back to these people, how does design impact these folks? And how does it impact people out here? Well, in our case, what we did is we did the same things we do in our design work, and we observed, listened, intuited, and created. And when we did that, we heard things like, I'd love to stretch my legs and experiment. Heard things like, I'd love to get experience in startups. People, again, this new culture of being a little bit more um, uh, uh, risk prone or, or you know, entrepreneurial. Um, I'd love to teach others this cool work we get to do. When I lived in Chicago, I moved out to Seattle, I was trying to teach this as much as I could at Kellogg because I really wanted to bring this back. And I love teaching, I enjoy it. Um, but I also want people to learn it. The programs that are here now, thank God, are teaching all of this stuff and giving you guys classes I never had. And finally, we hear things like, I'd love to work on prog programs targeted social impact. Again, this personal meaning element. Um, I really want to do things that impact the world in a positive way. And so what we did is we built things that we call accelerators. Um, and by the way, this is about Frog, but this is really kind of a lesson for everybody. Um, and this is the first time I've actually given this talk. So you guys will have to tell me what you think about Frog uh, in these accelerators. But really, so I'd love to stretch my legs and experiment. We uh, created something called Frog Labs. Walter mentioned that in my intro. I'd love to get experience in startups. We called something Frog Ventures. By the way, if you haven't figured it out already, our brand architecture is a pinned frog to everything. <laughs> Um, I love to teach others this cool work we get to do, created something called Frog Camp. And finally, I'd love to work on programs targeted social impact. We have something called Frog Impact. Now, these are not like things that you dedicate yourself to and that's what you do to the exclusion of others, but you get an opportunity to try and uh, try your hand at these different things. And when, when I say that we've built new accelerators, I don't mean the executive directors at Frog. I mean all of Frogs got together and created this mostly from the ground up. Um, Ventures was the only one where we hired somebody to actually come back to Frog, in his case, um, and create that. But everything else was ground up. It was motivated by people who wanted to do these things. So 
I'm going to talk about Frog Labs for a second because um, I'm the co-lead of it, now becoming the lead as of April. Um, and I'm really excited about it, but it's one of those things that was from uh, by frogs for frogs. Um, and by that I mean, as you guys look at your careers, think about things that you can do and not look for things that people can give to you. Um, over drinks at our holiday party a year ago, I was talking to one of our design technologists who is um, so talented I don't fully understand the breadth of his skills. Um, he speaks worldwide on incredible um, software and, and technology innovation. Um, but we talked about the fact that like, he knows stuff that honestly our, our corporate clients um, can't use. Um, it is so far out there that there are things, there's talent, not only people like him, but others at Frog who have these crazy talents that they may not be able to use on all of our client projects. So whether you want to call it lying fallow, um, there are things we all know. And wouldn't it be great if we could actually you know, leverage our strengths and say, I'm going to do this new thing. Um, so that was kind of what we observed. We're certainly not alone in that situation. Lots of companies have people who aren't fully utilized um, in their whole brains. Google did it famously with 20% uh, of your time could be devoted to your passion projects. Um, it'll take some time for us to build. This was me managing internal expectations at Frog, um, but not a lot. And this is something that uh, the Rockwell Group did, a consulting firm, on the nature of play with children, and they built this out. And so those things are really kind of um, the kinds of investments that I was trying to get Frog to, to think about. Um, there's a revenue opportunity here as well for a place like Frog, um, but we wanted to walk before we ran. So we're not looking to make money off of Frog Labs. This was purely an idea of, well, geez, if we have these talents, what could we do? What do we get really excited about that we can actually work on? Uh, the image is from MIT Media Labs that um, probably all of you know, but they actually do charge for some access to their programs. Um, it was an interesting model, not one that we adopted, but we wanted to say, well, what did people get really excited about? So we created this thing, again, of frogs by frogs, called Frog Labs. Um, and I'm not going to read the bottom part, but it's, it's a new platform for us to work on big things our clients aren't asking about that are crazy cool. Um, and maybe there's going to be an application going forward for it, but we might not even know what that is. So in some ways, it's design as strategy for frog. We are challenging ourselves to do new things that we aren't even sure what we're going to do with them. The uh, image is of our reinvention of the public payphone for the city of New York. Um, it's a public example, but um, really cool rethinking of um, something we called Beacon, but I won't talk about it now. There's a great quote from Charles Eames that uh, we looked at, uh, it's a favorite quote of mine, that uh, when asked if he'd ever um, compromised, he said, I've never been forced to accept compromises but I've willingly accepted constraints. And so we thought, you know, this isn't like, let's create something and we're going to take Frog in any which way. We're going to take it, have 100 ideas, and they're all going to take us into different directions. Um, what are we going to do? So again, I want to read this, but you can see the big type. What are the principles we we're trying to do? We wanted to actually make something that allowed for some guardrails. Um, and so there's sexy but tangible. Um, so you have to, it might be cool, but you got to make something. You can't just talk about it. You can't make deckware. You can actually make something. Um, things like public, not private. We can't tinker in the corner and think we have some awesome new idea. We can actually put it out in the world and get feedback. And it may be scary because we might not actually um, have the right answer. Things like real world impact, um, all crafts being involved. Um, so these are really the kinds of things we tried to do to say, okay, well, if there are people who have talent and they really want to stretch, how can we give them the, the runway to go do some amazing things, um, but still you know, not be crazy with our um, you know, good sized firm, 45 year old history. So what are some of those things, some teasers of what we've uh, been working on? Um, we looked at different challenges and this was part of a worldwide um, competition, if you will, a uh, very friendly competition inside Frog. So we have nine studios around the world and a couple satellites. Um, and we got everybody to say, what excites you? And give us the problem statement, give us kind of the framed area and some initial concepts. And so people submitted, um, I think it was 74 concepts from around the world was on their own time um, to get kind of the first cohort of these things. So one of them was about uh, providing mobile power um, in times of need, uh, in disaster times, in camping times, just when you're off the grid. 
Um, and so one of them is a concept called revolver. So in a kind of elegant solution, it's a little hard to see, but um, you don't want to carry around a personal wind turbine that's about this tall and take up space, particularly in your apartment. This was out of our New York studio. You can see kind of the skyline after Hurricane Sandy. And everybody's plugging in, you know, 10 cords into the one outlet on their block that works. Um, but space is at a, a premium, so that it actually folds up so it stores in your closet. So we observed a need of people going about power um, and said, how are ways we can do this and challenge ourselves to come up with an entirely new area? Uh, whether it has a buyer, we don't know. Um, but that's not really the point. There has been interest. It's won a design prize, and that's all great. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's about stretching our thinking about what this means. Um, a personal afraid of mine, I'm, a, I'm the global automotives lead for Frog. Um, if we think about the ways that people live in increasingly dense cities, uh, we think about mobility, flexibility, and we think about autonomous cars, which we're thinking about quite a lot. Um, how can we really change how people are living? And so one of the things we've come up with and talked about is um, something called Flexpartment. Um, when you have an autonomous car, and uh, Jerry's like, yeah, we've kind of probably thought about that a little bit. Um, they're actually racing Audis autonomously, but um, I won't steal their thunder. Um, you can do things like take out steering wheels. You can take out seats. You can make it look like a compartment. Um, and if you want to need to, uh, you can I look at these, and I see Brussels sprout stocks. <laughs> Um, but if you had stocks in different parts of the city and you had a tough week at work, you could park your house closer to your office. Similarly, you know, get out of town. Um, so different things of stretching our mind about how we live in sort of a Jetson-like pod with interchangeable chassis um, to how you actually drive around the city and the impact that has on everything, everything from the ethics of autonomous cars, which are fascinating. It can be programmed to kill you first instead of the other three people in the other car that it senses coming towards you. Um, things like that. Um, to, uh, and this is really kind of one of the last ones, but you know, what does space tourism feel like? Not for the people paying several million dollars to go, but if you think about Pan Am in the 60s, when people were traveling internationally on jet travel, like think of that era applied to space, right? This isn't that far away. And we actually did the strategic analysis to look at how the price comes down over time and when does it become kind of a, a price point that makes sense. It's not that far off. Um, it's a provocative image because one of our folks said they don't have fireplaces in space. <laughs> so, I know, kind of humor me for a little bit. Um, this one is super cool. It's going on right now. Um, so there aren't final images, but we're looking at the journey from really prep to takeoff to in space to landing to even memorializing your experience. Um, and I don't know if you can see that. This is just one of the slides from the, the deck. The key activities, and this is one of the reasons I was personally excited about it, is to test the prototypes we come up with. Uh, we're looking at doing zero-G flights um, and taking those prototypes into these planes that they, if you know anything about these planes, they call them the Vomit Comet. <laughs> they go up and down in parabolic arcs. Um, and you're weightless for, I don't know, 30 seconds apiece or something like that. So I said, yeah, let's do this labs because I want to go. Um, so that, that one's particularly exciting. Um, it should really turn out to be pretty cool. But overall, this is a, 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 a mosaic of some of the awesome things that came out. Everything from a curtainless shower in the top left um, to reimagining the agricultural ecosystem and flow of goods through the system um, to make sure there's less waste. And we're focusing on the retail experience in that one. To the e-bike interface to um, disaster preparedness in the middle of the right. Um, the one on the bottom right is not our concept. It's sort of a mood board image of the one that is tackling privacy and our digital exhaust in our lives. Um, but a particularly interesting sort of, I think it's lead <laughs> lined um, privacy cloak. And then the one on the top is looking at something as simple as helping diabetics measure their food intake with um, uh, augmenting your iPhone with a, a um, weight sensor. So you can weigh your food, you can weigh drinks, you can do all those sorts of things and assess um, health implications. They have luminosity meters and they have accelerometers. It'd be relatively easy to actually put a, a weight sensor on there. And we got a ton of these. Um, so this is but a screen grab of the 230 pages of awesome things that came through. Um, and we're working on a few um, at, the, at the present moment, um, some educate kids toys and education concepts. Um, of helping kids actually figure out um, their presence in the environment 
Um, it's an educational game that is tablet-based um, from some research we did in China, um, but to help uh, awareness of climate change and um, actually sensing technology. So you're helping the, the polar bear actually find his, um, sorry, her way home into her family um, throughout the day of, of this experience, but then there are also offline physical objects that help augment that um, and you know, force the child to go out and interact with the world. <laughs> so not just sitting in front of a tablet. Um, but in summary, so as I look at design as strategy and how it impacts our company as we look out into the world, there's this zeitgeist that's going on, there's a culture shift and a new mindset, there's an impact of design on culture as a human-centered kind of discipline, um, and there's really eating your own dog food. And that's us actually saying, well, how would we observe our own folks internally and how would we behave and change our uh, business model differently so we can actually start to uh, address some of these concerns and keep people really excited about uh, creating for Frog and, and working in our company. So one last thought, what does this mean for you? Um, help companies understand design co in this context. It's not just about creating products for other people while the cobbler's children go shoeless. It's about solving your own problems too. Um, so those things that we talked about, yes, absolutely flex your muscles and develop. Um, absolutely advocate to be seen as human and not just an interchangeable cog in your machine. Um, but also finally, this is the part that's really key, and this is why I think they kind of frog let me um, co-create Frog Labs, is so we're looking at just creating new paths in ways we're not even sure. And um, that sort of bandwidth has been really valuable. And, and that freedom has been really valuable to give that, uh, that leeway. So um, that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, thank you very much. And I uh, would love to talk afterwards. Let me know about this. Thank you. Thank you.